morning, everyone. Last year, so let me just do a quick little uh, intro. So last year, for those who uh, haven't seen me for a couple of years, uh, last year I got married. Amen. Everyone, uh, everyone keeps asking me, so how's it going? So the, the quick update, I'm, I'm learning to argue well, which means I'm not right every time we argue, and learning to uh, love and to be loved. So it is lovely. It's a very, very cool little uh, part of the journey, part of the journey. Um, but here this morning, the reason I bring it up, I'll get uh, past you and just uh, check this little bad boy. <laughs> check, check. Oh, there we go. Grab the guys up the back, do it. Otherwise, I will grab a mic. Uh, that's better? Okay. Uh, the reason I bring that up, first of all, just it's a little life update. But secondly, because I feel like I am back at my wedding. One of those strange things when you get married is it's the weirdest grouping of family and friends and work colleagues and old school friends and random people all together for something so much bigger than yourself. And I feel like that today. I feel like i am kind of got like a little second wedding going on here today. So many of my different parts of my church family here today, and it's actually a real blessing. Um, so I just want to acknowledge a couple of the, the church families that are here, because it just makes me really, really proud. Beginning with my uh, Christchurch crew, thank you so much for leading us in worship this morning. I'm so proud of you guys. You did so good. So thank you. Um, the Whangarei students, it's so amazing to have you here. Thank you to all the ones who have turned up um, again. Thank you for being here. And Whangarei Church, thank you so much. Um, it's just so lovely to see you all. And all three of these families together, so I'm kind of thrilled. I also just want to acknowledge um, in the room are some friends, so thank you for uh, the way you speak into my life. And also some family. I've got some family here. So Auntie Lane, one of the locals, and Uncle Trevor and Auntie Muriel from uh, Hamilton. So I've got family, friends, school. Like, it's just, I feel like another little, I, need, I don't have my wife here, so <laughs> that's the downside. Um, but thank you for being here, and thank you so much for the Northland hospitality and generosity that we've experienced and also just a big thank you to Anna. Thank you for loving on us and being our mum all week and our, our principal, so thank you. This morning, I promise I am a pastor, but uh, it's a sermonette, so I promise you're not about to get a 50-minute sermon. Um, you know, Holy Spirit is working in all of us, but we don't necessarily need him to uh, develop our patience today if that's still your thing, so thank you. <laughs> Annabelle and Blake, I love that intro. What's missing? There's a very familiar church sign slogan, and I see it I often driving around the South Island now, but in the North Island I'd particularly see it, you know, those churches with the sign out the front, and they'd put something up, and one of the common ones is this one, CH dash dash CH, what's missing? You are. It's a neat, little, a neat little visual gag that kind of takes the you are out of church and says that's what's missing. It's a church saying, hey, What's missing in our congregation and in this, our place is you. We'd love to invite you in. Nice way to do it, and I really like it. But the last time I saw it, and it was down uh, as I was driving around Wellington, I saw a church with this, and it clicked. I'm like, well, it implies that church is a building, a place, and a program. And so what's missing is a physical person on a seat. But our understanding of church is church is not this building. Church is not this program. Church is us. We are church. And so if we were to apply that question to ourselves this morning, what's missing from or in us? Because we are church. What's missing? One of the uh, amazing things about us as humans is we're we're pretty perceptive, and yet often we can't see the gaps in our own lives. Have you ever been talking to someone, and you're referring to someone else, and you simply go, yeah, but we know what they're like, everyone nods. Because they know what that other person's like. You just have to go, but we know what they're like, and everyone knows exactly what you mean. And yet the irony is, if you ask that other person, they probably would be quite surprised to know that everyone knows them by this deficiency or this little trait or this little quirk. We can often be quite blind at what's actually missing in our own lives and our own walks. A little sidestep. Go on with me with this little uh, sidestep. 
We live in a superhero era. And I'm going to go on the one that's probably come to mind, but I'm going to land somewhere more profound that uh, fleshes out our what's missing this morning. Number one, it's very, very obvious. You, you look at any movie, you look at any TV program at the moment, we live in a superhero era. There's never been a period of modern entertainment when superheroes absolutely rule the roost. Uh, we are in, in many ways, a superhero era. We love our stories of superheroes with superpowers who rescue and save people. We love it. We just These are exciting stories that unlock something in us as humans. That desire to see people rescued, the desire to see that big battle of good and evil fought out in an amazing way, and our superhero stories do that. We live in a superhero era. But there are some amazing lessons that, first of all, superheroes teach us. These stories teach us. Number one, a superhero with no powers is just a normal human being. A superhero has to have special powers to be a superhero. Somebody who just rescues and saves people with no powers is just a hero. To be a superhero, you've got to have something in addition. There's got to be some extra power to what you do. Secondly, we find out that a superhero who has powers, needs to know what their powers are, and has to choose to use them. There are no super lazy boys. There are no super just can't be bothered girls. They are not superheroes. We don't know about them because they're still on the couch. A superhero has to choose to use their powers to be a superhero. And they have to choose to use it for good. They choose to use it in another way. They're a super villain. Knowing power, choosing to use it, and choosing to use it for good. That's the heart of our superhero stories. The other thing we find out, it doesn't matter what superhero you are, when you work together as a team, you're always more effective. It doesn't matter if you're Superman. If you suddenly add some other superheroes around, that team is so much more effective than a superhero just by themselves. This week, we've been looking at uh, differences, celebrating the unique way that God's created each one of us, celebrating our own differences, and also celebrating each other's differences. And when we do that, that's part of the value and respect and love that God shows us. And when we step into that, we have the heart of God, loving one another, working with one another. And that's what we've been talking about this week, and it's been good. To look at that this morning, um, Daniel, where are you? Come on down. I've got a couple of questions. I was talking to Daniel uh, this week and uh, mentioning a little bit around superheroes, and uh, I love what he shared with me, and so I've asked him to come down and share this morning. So I'm going to begin, because I was fascinated, Daniel, I love you are a unique creation of God, and I love the way that he's made you, and you were sharing that you even um, sort of some supervillains even stand out for you, and there's one supervillain that stands out for you. Who's that? Deathstroke. Excellent. So we don't normally look at supervillains, but I love that you do. And again, I love the way that you engage with these stories in a unique way. What makes Deathstroke stand out for you from all the other supervillains? The way he uses technology to fight instead of hands-on. Okay. And when you look over at the other side, so who... Um, don't get distracted by the other students. Um, if you're looking at the other side who, you know, he may be fighting, so looking at superheroes, who's a superhero that stands out for you? Batman. Batman? I... See a few nods, uh, always a good uh, common superhero. But why does Batman stand out for you? What do you like about Batman? Because he doesn't have a superpower, but he still manages to win fights. Yeah. How does he do that? What's he got that he's using that's... His brains. Yeah. Now, something that I love that you uh, were sharing with me is he also got something passed down from his parents. When his parents passed away, um, there was something that they passed on to him. What was that? A lot of money and good designs. Yeah. And he's made use of that. Awesome. Thank you, Daniel. When I was thinking about superheroes, there was one that uh, often stands out for me, and it was very similar to Daniel, and that's Batman. Batman's very, very cool, but he doesn't have an inherent power, but what he has is a legacy passed on from his parents, particularly his dad. Wealth, technology, and a legacy to use it for good. And that gets passed down to him. 
And every day he has to choose to use it for good. And what I love about Batman is he struggles. He's known as the Dark Knight because he sometimes struggles to use this legacy of what's been passed down to him that makes him a superhero, struggles to use it for good. But we know he's a superhero because he always makes the choice to use it, even though he struggles with that. And I don't know about you, but sometimes, and I think some of you are already starting to see the parallels, we have a father who has passed down to each one of us a whole lot of special things and a legacy to use it for good. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel like Batman and I struggle with that legacy that our Heavenly Father's passed down to us. Every day to use His tools, His power for good. But I want to be like Batman. I want to, at the end of the day, always choose to use everything God's given me and invited me to be a part of for his work, to be a superhero and not a super villain. Because we live in a superhero era. And the reality is it's not these stories that we celebrate. The reality is we live in a superhero era because Jesus Christ came, lived, died on the cross and was resurrected. And when he did that, he showed that there is only one true superhero. We may love the stories from DC and Marvel about these superheroes, but they are fictional. We know that. We see them on the page. We see them on the screen. But their power cannot touch us. We love the story, and they can inspire us, but they can't do any more than that. There is only one true superhero whose power is so much more infinite than any of our favorite superheroes. Jesus Christ. And when he died on the cross and was resurrected, he broke every single thing, every kind of evil there is. He broke it. He conquered it. There is only one true superhero. And we live in a superhero era because when he was resurrected, he said, now here's the plan. My power is available to you. No other superhero takes their power and gives it away. They use their power to do good, but no other superhero gives their power away. Jesus does. Through the work of the Holy Spirit in each one of us, he says, the power that is mine is now yours. What are you going to do with it? We live in a superhero era where the superheroes are you and I. And the challenge is this. Do we know that we have power? Because if we don't, we're just a normal human being. Have we made a choice to use the power that God has for us? Because if we don't, we're just super lazy boy or super can't be bothered girl sitting on the couch. And do we choose to use that power for good? Or are we actually super villains? The Bible paints these incredible pictures where some take the tools of God and use it for themselves or against God, and they become our supervillains. The choice is ours, but we live in a superhero era, all because there is one true superhero. There's an incredible story from 1954. There was this uh, gentleman here. His name was Francis Henning. And uh, he was a criminal, and so that's how he wanted it. He wasn't a supervillain by any means, and you'll see why when I explain uh, the story. But he was trying to be a supervillain, but uh, not, not very effective. And uh, he had done a little bit of counterfeiting and realized, or had an idea in 1954, he decided to go into uh, big-time counterfeiting some American currency. And, of course, most counterfeiters will choose $20 bills, $100 bills because, you know, that just, that's some nice currency to try and get out there and get some money. He decided that nobody had tried counterfeiting nickels, five-cent pieces. And he was like, well, I'd have the game all to myself, you know, that this sounds good. So he created the big press, he got the medal, and he churned out 500,000 nickels, fake nickels, with just one little flaw that only the best Secret Service agents could spot. 500,000. A couple of hundred thousand of those, he somehow got into circulation. But then he got to the point where he realized there wasn't a lot you can do with that many nickels. 
even back in 1954, there's not a lot you can do with that many five cent pieces. You can't buy a house. Even back then, you couldn't even really buy a whole lot of groceries with five cent pieces. He was stuck with all of these nickels going, okay, that didn't quite work out as I thought. Good plan, not quite thought through. Not the world's best supervillain or even really a good villain by any stretch of the imagination. At that point, the Secret Service sort of uh, realized that for some strange reason, it was even a surprise to them, there were all these fake nickels in circulation, and it wasn't very hard to uh, track Francis down. As he was being chased, he actually took um, about a couple of hundred thousand of uh, the rest of the nickels and tried to get rid of the evidence in a nearby river. So just threw them into the river and uh, kept going and was caught. And they only got about 30,000 of the 500,000 nickels and then managed to get the ones in circulation out of circulation. And he went to jail for three years. One of the uh, amusing parts of the story, for those who like to sort of know how stories end, the little known as the Henning nickels have actually become one of the most popular and sought after coins in coin collectors' collections. So the uh, irony or coincidence or end result is he actually has one of the most valuable coins that collectors always want. And you'll, you'll find the patch of river where he got rid of a lot of the coins, you'll often see coin collectors go there to dredge up one of these uh, little henning nickels to uh, get in their collection. So he's uh, ironically created um, something of worth, but many, many years later, after doing some time. Francis took something genuine and tried to replicate it in his image for his own purpose, and it didn't work. It didn't work. We do the same when we substitute God's way for our way, when we take things and try to do it, his things, and try to do them our way. The worst counterfeit is when we try and do life, particularly when we try and do church in our power, in our way for our glory. It doesn't work. One of the incredible things is God says... Everything you need, I will give you. And it's like he puts down a stack of $100 bills on a table and says, spend this for my glory, for my way, but everything you need is there. Just please go. And we're like, no, no, Lord, I'm going to show you how, how to actually do it. I don't need your resources. I'm going to churn out some five-cent pieces and show you how it's really done. Everything we need, God provides because Jesus died and was resurrected, and because the Holy Spirit just knits that into our lives today. All of the power, everything we need is available to us. I love what Paul shares in Romans 12. There are three passages where Paul talks about the gifts of the Spirit, these incredible things that the Spirit gives each one of us to do church, to be effective, powerful, incredible church. And I love that um, Annabelle and Blake started out, fruits of the Spirit. That's something else that the Holy Spirit does in us. Creates these incredible fruits. Here's what Paul says in Romans 12. Just as our bodies have many parts, and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body, and we all belong to each other. In his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, Prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you're a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. Now, we often stop there. But every single time, in Romans 12, in Ephesians 4, and in 1 Corinthians 12, where Paul mentions spiritual gifts, what the Holy Spirit gives us to be church and to do church, he ends each single passage by then describing what this work will look like. That's telling. Here's how he wraps up Romans 12. So he's just talked about spiritual gifts, the ability to build up church, to be church, and he says, don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. In Romans, or 1 Corinthians 12, 
a whole chapter on spiritual gifts and then he rolls into 1 Corinthians 13, which is the love chapter. What takes away the power that the Holy Spirit gives us is when we don't use it with God's heart for his purpose. God doesn't want us to become supervillains, to use the power that he gives us to become supervillains. And what makes a supervillain is someone who does not have a heart for others. And what turns us into supervillains is when we take the power of God, what Christ has done for us, and we don't have a heart for others in using it. We become supervillains. And Paul, every single time he mentions spiritual gifts, always lands on going, but you've got to make sure that love that the heart behind you using what the Holy Spirit does in you and through you is love. Every time. I love what he does at the end of the Ephesians 4 one. So he's just again mentioned all of the spiritual gifts and he puts it this way, straight into verse 15 from Ephesians 4. And he says, Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow. And I love this final picture that he paints of what church will look like using love and the spiritual gifts the Holy Spirit works through us so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Isn't that a beautiful picture of church? When we simply trust the work of God in us as church, it produces something that's healthy and growing and full of love. That's a church that reflects the head of the body. That's a church that each one of us is blessed to be a part of, is valued as a part of, and that I know other people will go, I've got to be part of that church to meet the head that makes that all possible. That's the work that God does in us as his superheroes. My last little thing, I need a student from Whangarei. No? <laughs> student from Whangarei. I promise it won't be embarrassing and it will be worth your time, but I just need somebody courageous enough to come up. Oh, Libby Roo, come on down. Excellent. Come on up here beside me. Thank you, Libby. It is... Whew, you're doing well. You look less nervous than I am. Libby, I have two little, um, there's two rounds to this. So this is round number one. It's, it's not a trick. So all I need you to do, what God wants to do, so with the beautiful work that he does in us and the Holy Spirit does, it's like he's given us something good and he you know, wants us to take it and to use it and enjoy it. So I'm going to show that by giving you a Kit Kat. And all I need you to do for 15 seconds is I'll give it to you and you just hold on to it. It's like when God gives us something good, we hold on to it because that's good, okay? So just hold on to it. Now, no matter what I say or do, don't let it go. Is that cool? So just don't let it go for anything. Okay, so excellent, love you, Ruth. So you hold on to that. 15 seconds, just hold on to it. And if you can, then it's all yours. Okay. All right, good. 15 seconds begins now. Okay, so shake that out a bit for me. Shake that. Yep, good. It's not slipping out. It's like not, no. Uh, hold on, let me just shake that a little bit. Myself. No, that's no. you've got a good grip on that. All right, just um, point out to your mum down there. She's, she's a great teacher. No, oh, no, you, and, no, okay, good. Um, oh, I might have to dig a little bit deeper. Okay, um, Libby Roo, I am uh, you know visiting pastor, and I've asked you to, if you can just drop that now, that'd be great. So if you just drop that, it'd be good. Your mum's here. Is this, uh, she asked you not to obey you know, visiting pastors. Just drop that. You are good. All right, well done. All right, that's 15 seconds. Very good. Now, that's round number one, Libby. So this is round number two. So this is not a trick. I'm not doing something weird. So that's, now you can, you've got two choices. You have in your hand one Kit Kat, and that's good. That is all yours. But you, this is round number two, so completely different round. You can either go back and sit with your mum with that one, and that is yours, or you can let that one go and take the four and go back and have a seat. It's not a trick. I'm not going to do anything else, but it's your choice right now. Take the one or drop that one and take the four, and you can go back to your seat. And that's the last this morning. What do you want to do? I promise you, promise you it's not a trick. <laughs> I think she's worked with me before, but no. Okay, totally your choice, and I promise you, promise you, promise you it's not a trick. 
Well done. Good choice. <clears throat> Hi. Livy, you did really good. It's amazing. I, I often use that illustration, and over half the time I do it, the person, the young person goes back with just the one. And I'm just like, but, but there's four. <laughs> and they're just like, no, I'm, I'm happy with the one. We do the same with the gifts of God. The Bible tells us that every morning his mercies, his goodness, his power, his presence, his love for us is fresh. It's available. And so many of us are holding on to the blessings and the power of yesterday when God says, let that go. You should have already consumed that and shared that. Now today, expectantly reach out and I will provide. I will provide. We are God's superheroes called to simply trust his work and his goodness and to share it and then to keep reaching a hand out and going, God, I know you've got something else that will bless me and bless others. Replenish me, refill me, Lord, and keep me going. Don't hold on to the blessings in his work of yesterday. He's got something incredible for us today. We are church. Christ has died. It's all conquered. We know the end. Trust his work in you. Be the superhero he calls you to be and be blessed as that makes an impact in your family, in your school, in your community. Be the superhero God's called you to be.